since everyone can find a seat, we're going to start. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank you to all the candidates for making time to be here this evening. I just have a few neighborhood announcements. I've been given about four to six minutes before I get the hook. I wanted to um, let you know about a few things. We had a large Kennedy Park cleanup on Saturday, September 10th, where we had about 50 volunteers. We did a great job cleaning the park, and we got some painting and planting projects done as well. And I thank everybody that volunteered that day. That is our last cleanup of the season. We just had the 2011 Kennedy Park Car Show. I know I saw a lot of you there. We actually had a great day. The weather cooperated. We had about 175 cars, trucks, and motorcycles come out and take part. It was our first fundraiser for a brand new handicapped accessible playground at Kennedy Park, and we raised $3,500. For anyone that's interested, the plans for our new playground are by the front table on the way in if you want to take a look at those. Um, we've submitted the plans. Uh, it's going to be going to public hearing within the next two weeks, and we will be doing a whole year's worth of events to continue to fundraise for the playground. Our next event is Christmas at Kennedy. It's going to be a date to be determined in December. We are now collecting toys, new unwrapped toys. Uh, tonight is the first night that we're collecting them, and we'll be collecting them through the season, um, ending with our Christmas at Kennedy event. We also have a comedy show at Whites of Westport in January on Friday, January 13th. And we'll have tickets available for that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is our neighborhood banners. We've been working with a local artist who's here tonight, Scott Camara. Right here. And Scott did all the sketch work and painting of our new neighborhood banners, which we have right up front here. And we love them, they came out great. He did a great job on that. Uh, we have 15 of them already ordered, and if anyone else from the neighborhood or from the city wants to order a banner, it has our neighborhood association and logo at the top, the sponsor, whoever sponsors it at the bottom, and then our website, and then the sketch that Scott did of our neighborhood and the park. So if anyone else wants to order one, you can see me. And am I out of time? I am going to announce uh, two people. Greg Naraki, he's a very active board member of our Neighborhood Association. He is going to be moderating tonight's event. And Melanie Lee, she's the vice president of our Neighborhood Association. She is going to be doing the timing of the event on the candidates' questions, answers. Thank you, Pam. It is a privilege uh, to be here this evening to moderate this event. Um, what I'm going to do is give an explanation of the format of the questioning that our candidates have agreed to. Uh, we have 17 of the 18 candidates who are um, here with us tonight. We're going to begin with all 18 of them giving a minute and a half introduction of themselves. Um, and then you'll see that we've kind of divided them up into three separate groups. The first two groups of six, the last group of five. All 18 candidates are going to be presented with one umbrella topic. For example, that topic might be public works. And then each group is going to be asked a question related to that one topic. Um, so as to not listen to 18 people, I'll answer the same question. But they're all going to be related to that one topic. They're going to be given one minute to respond. Uh, Melanie's going to be keeping time, and she's going to be giving them a warning when there's um, a 10 seconds left, and then to stop. When, when their time has run out. Um, the candidates are seated in the order that they're going to be presented in group one, two, and three. Um, and we just ask our audience to remain respectful of our candidates who are up here and uh, remain as quiet as possible when they are speaking. And if you have not done so already, please use this time to silence your cell phones out of respect for our candidates. 
We're going to start with uh, Kennedy introductions. And the first group, uh, Mike Ramos, is going to start us off. A little short for me, but hi, my name is Mike Ramos. I'm a candidate for city council. I want to first thank everyone for being here. Thank the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association, PM, and the other board members for being here, because I, I know it takes an awful lot to put, a, put an event like this together. I did prepare something. There's some, a few things that are very important to me, and I wanted to make sure that I covered everything so specifically. Um, I'm a candidate for city, city council, and I want to tell you why. I live, I work here, and I attended college at BCC. I'm the father of two beautiful little girls. My wife and I own a home here, and for those reasons alone, I am concerned and interested in where our city is going. But it's more than just that. From the standpoint of crime, I have seen a change in direction that's frightening. Recently, Officer LaPointe and a couple other police officers attempted to make an arrest, and I believe they were successful, but in the process, a group started throwing rocks at them. And in the history of me living in the city, I have never seen such disrespect for law enforcement. That concerns me. That is why I think public safety is one of the single most important issues and obstacles that we face, because all of the other things that mean so much to us, like education, economic growth, arts and entertainment, are all dependent on our ability to provide a safe community. Businesses do not relocate to communities that are not safe. Families do not buy houses if they cannot take the kids to the park. And our ability to educate our youth is diminished as well. Our seniors, in addition, need to feel safe. We're down 60 police officers. We need them back. I have an, econo an economic plan that I put together for the waterfront, and public safety is going to be crucial for that. Thank you. The next candidate is Robert DeRogers. My name is Robert DeRoses. Uh, I am the son of the late Norman Mary Ann Wall DeRoses. Uh, I'm a long life resident of Fall River and I've been married for 21 years and currently living in Fall River down the Copacut area. I have two children, Kayla who is uh, attending BCC and Sydney who's a student at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School. I am a retired correction officer from the Mass Department of Corrections, having served there for a capacity of 20 years. Currently, I am self-employed and the owner of home, uh, DeRoja's Home Improvement. I am a hardworking and average citizen, and I am not affiliated with any special interest groups or organization. Because I am a long-life resident of Fall River and a homeowner for 17 years, a small business owner, and have educated my children in Fall River school system, I have a proven invested in interest in the future of the city. My interest in serving as a city council member is to be a true and honest voice for the citizens of Fall River, whose voice are often not heard by local representatives, who have the power and ability to improve the quality of life. As a resident of Fall River, I understand the frustration many other, many, uh, excuse me, I understand the frustration many, many others often experience in trying to resolve everyday problems. If I'm awarded the opportunity to serve, I will do my best to address issues and concerns facing our neighborhood one, t one issue at a time. Thank you. Brad Kelby. Thank you much, very much, everyone, uh, for coming this evening, and thank you to the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, my name is Attorney Bradford Kilby, uh, lifelong resident of the city. Uh, have three children, one of which is a college graduate. Uh, the youngest is a student at Durfee High School currently, and my daughter is a junior at Diamond. Um, prior to uh, opening the law practice about 15 years ago, I was a high school teacher at Durfee High School dealing with at risk students. Uh, left that to start a small business, uh, worked hard at that small business, and uh, it continues as today. In terms of public service, I was a member of the school committee for eight years under the Ed Lambert administration. Um, and I'm very, very proud of the positions that I took and the votes that I've uh, taken uh, during that period of time. Uh, for the last six years, I've been a member of the Fort Worth City Council. Um, I pride myself on researching issues, taking votes that I feel are in the best interest of the community and the constituents that I serve. I think if you ask most of the other elected officials that served with me over the last 15, 16 years or so, most of them, if not all, will say that I'm fair, honest, and straightforward, and that's how I continue uh, to pledge to conduct myself in the future. I'm not adverse to taking strong stands. 
uh, when it is appropriate and if certainly not adverse as being a member of the team when the vote is uh, appropriate as well. So I thank you very much and I hope you consider me November 8th for one of your nine votes as a former city councilor. Thank you. Bob Bowden. I'm Bob Bowden. I've been in Fall River for over 60 years and been in business for 38 years in the real estate business. I served 12 years on the water board. We have a nice uh, water tank on Townsend Hill, one of the things we pushed along with 42 miles of new pipes. Um, I'm hoping that being on the city council, I'm into show and tell, I hope that we will have a good city and business relationship that will help us quite a bit on jobs, on the police department, and fire department, I think a solid chunk of our budget must be devoted to fire and police, not just grants. Grants are extras. A civilized society helps its people. Some of the money you can get, we already have a three quarter of a percent meals tax that we get from the state, which, we, which our council did uh, choose to opt into, and we have a $500 uh, vacant building fee. We can get that uh, to help us along with uh, part of our budget. Grants will, grants will be extra. For our schools, we need to know what the value is of our schools before we either give them away or sell them. We also need to have an environmental assessment so it doesn't kick us in the teeth later on and we get sued. Uh, if you want to know more about my candidacy, just go to my website, votebobbooten.com. Thank you. Our next candidate is Linda Pereira. I like to see that Bob recycles. Good evening. First of all, I would certainly like to thank the Neighborhood Association for putting on this forum also those of you who took time out of your schedule to be here and thankfully because we do have the cameras here I hope that the people at home are listening and watching to hear what we all have to say I've been on the council for quite some time and most of you know who I am and know what I stand for my um, backbone is to tell it like it is I don't care if it's something that people agree with or don't agree with but you're going to know where I stand either way I am a mother of two. My daughters are 34 and 35. I can't believe it since I'm only 29. I have four grandchildren, and I have lived in Fall River all of my life. I am committed to children and families. That's the work that I've done. My husband and I also owned Harry's Restaurant on South Main Street for a number of years, so I know the effects um, to a small business. I presently am employed at the district attorney's office, and I am an investigator on child sexual abuse and elder sexual abuse cases. And from that, what I see in Fall River is horrifying. I think we need to do more with securing quarries on individuals. And as a matter of fact, I had spoken to Mayor Flanagan about that when we had our first meeting, that one of my major concerns with the crime level of Fall River is that people are allowed to come to Fall River and no quarries. Thank you very much. Our final candidate in group one is Jeff Gregory. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association for having this event. My name is Jeff Gregory. Several years ago, I was the former president of the Fall River Police Union. And in the coming weeks, I'd like to ask all the people here in the voting public of Fall River to ask the candidates what they bring to the table. Because back then, back in 2002, 2003, I had a seat at the table. And when I left the table with other good people during that time period in the Lambert administration, the school department was fully funded, the DPW was at full strength, the fire department wasn't dangling with grant positions, and the Fall River Police Department had 260 police officers protecting the city of Fall River. My name is Jeff Gregory. I'd be glad to help serve. I'm retired and it will be a full-time position serving the public of Fall River. Thank you very much. Beginning group two, we have Chris Bartley. Chris, if you want to go to the center mic. Good evening. My name is Chris Bartley. 
and I am a lifelong resident of Fall River along with my wife and my son. I've been active in many community organizations throughout the city and with your vote of confidence, I am committed to restoring integrity to our city council. We need individuals that are forward thinkers, people that have the leadership and foresight to plan ahead for our future. We also need to bridge the gap between our local government and our citizens of the city, ensuring that good government is working for them. We also need to improve our relationships and we also need to foster better working partnerships within all um, governments or all divisions of government. That's restored integrity. Unless we're able to accomplish those three things, then we will not um, be successful in our city and we will not flourish and improve our, our um, uh, quality of life. For more information, you can visit my website, which is www.chrisbartley.com. Thank you very much for the opportunity tonight, and I look forward to earning your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Next, we have Mike Mioza. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the uh, St. Anne's Neighborhood Association for giving the candidates an opportunity to present their vision on how they're going to make Fall River a better place to live, work, play, and visit. I also want to thank you for coming out tonight and taking the time to listen to the candidates. And lastly, I want to thank the voters of Fall River for making my platform part of the uh, November election. We hear a lot of negativity about the city, but I'm proud to be a Fall River right. I feel that Fall River should not be defined by its problems. I've had an opportunity to go door to door to meet many people throughout the, uh, the city. And I have, like Bob Boot, and I like show and tell as well. And I've had a postcard that I've had blown up. And in this postcard, uh, let me say this. I usually refer to Fall River as a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. We have all the pieces of the puzzle. We just may not have the right people putting the pieces together. Now, if you look at this, these are the four key pieces that, of the puzzle that will lead to economic development and the jobs that we all seek. And this is information that I received from the public. First one is education. Uh, we may never have a world-class education, but we certainly can have one that's more efficient and more effective. The development of the waterfront. We have an undeveloped waterfront. Well, I don't think we should put our eggs in that basket. We should uh, work on that. The cleanliness of the city is important. And obviously, the number one issue that I've heard is public safety. I hope you consider me for one of your nine votes on November 8th. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Joe Canara. Good evening. I, too, want to thank the Neighbor Association for putting this together. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with all of us. It is important that you get to meet the candidates to know what they're about and what they have to offer. I've been a lifelong resident of the city of Fall River. My wife and I have three children, all in the public school system of this city. I'm proud to be a Fall River resident. I'm also proud to be a Fall River city councilor. I've worked very hard to try to improve the quality of life in education, creating jobs, and throughout this city. You know, when you're a city councilor and you're faced with tough decisions, and trust me, I've taken a lot of tough votes. You also can't be distracted by people from outside this community who want to come to this community and try to ruin our city. I went to Washington to fight against people from outside this community trying to bring LNG to this community. I fought them in Washington, we fought them here, and you know what that does? It takes away from this community. We spent millions of dollars fighting LNG when we can be putting that money to good use, hiring more police officers, hiring more firefighters, putting more people to work in the public safety industry. And one of the things I heard someone talk about years ago, how we had all this, um, things were okay and a lot of people working in the police department. When I ran for office the first time, a firefighter fell off the back of a fire engine going to a fire call. The fire engine he was on was almost 30 years old. That's not right. We worked very hard to put in brand new fire apparatus, police apparatus, and everything else. And I'm gonna continue as your counselor to improve the quality of life in this city. Thank you. Paul De Silva. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. I prepared something, so. Um, 
I would like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to the candidates tonight and also like to express extend my sincere thanks to the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association and all neighborhood associations for all the great work that they do for our city. It is neighborhood associations just like this one, which I am proud to be involved with, that continue to have a vision of what the city can truly be. Unfortunately, our city is now facing some very tough times, times unlike any other that have, we have ever faced in our history. Our unemployment rate is very high, our police department is drastically understaffed, and our education system is underperforming. I've been out in the community talking with the great citizens of our city and I have heard their concerns. People are tired of their dirty neighborhoods, the increased crime, and just living in fear. As your next city councilor, I will be accessible to you, the residents, because each and every one of you deserve to live in a city that is safe and prosperous. I will work to improve the staffing levels of the city, city's vital services such as police, fire and public works and strive for excellence in matters of education. I will lead by example and be held accountable for the decisions that I make. Together with your help, we can begin to accomplish what we need in order to move this great city forward. In closing, I respectfully ask for one of your nine votes on November 8th. Thank you. Eric Perlin. Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association for sponsoring tonight's forum, and to all of you for taking time out of your schedules to attend. As I reflect back on my first two years of the City Council, I know that I've brought a unique and different and a new perspective to many issues facing the city. I know that I've gone in to each and every meeting, having thoroughly researched the issues and done my homework, and I've taken each and every vote in your best interest, not based on personality conflicts or other issues that sometimes get in the way in politics. I haven't been a rubber stamp. I haven't been an obstructionist. I've been your voice, an independent voice on the city council. I want to continue to be that voice. I'm proud of the relationships that I've forged with the neighborhood associations, with the police department and other groups working for change in our city. We've worked on littering issues, increasing fines for littering. We've worked through our public safety focus group meetings with the police department on getting them additional tools that they need to do their job. I've wor worked with merchants associations, the forever mill owners, the industrial park association, on trying to bring more economic development and jobs to our city. And I've worked on protecting funding for education in the city. I want to continue to do the work. As much work as I feel that I've done, I know there's a whole lot more to be done, and I want to keep doing it. I want to keep being your independent voice. So on Tuesday, November 8th, I do ask for one of your nine votes for Forever City Council. Thank you. Daniel Riga. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Rigo. I would also uh, like to thank the Neighborhood Association for having me here today and addressing this very important issue and the future of our city. I'm heavily involved in creating jobs for the people of this city and looking out for their best interest, trying to raise their standards. Coming across every single day people that are out there trying to find a job is very concerning to me. I want to be that person that's going to be out there on your city council that's going to be advocating for jobs, working with the mayor's office, whoever he or she may be. I want to be out there working with developers to bring good jobs to the citizens of Fall River. I also want to be part of being proactive with our police department, our police chief, and the administration to make sure that we get funding so we can bring our, citizen, our, our police department to full staff, as well as find uh, whatever means that we need to do to find funding, however it is for our fire department. Education is also a big part of my life because education starts and finishes in my home with my family, my three, daughter, my, my three children, Nadia, Brianna, and Kyle, who actually attends here at the charter school. And I'm very proud of the work that our administration has, has done, but we need more. We need more from the administration and our city council. Thank you very much, and I hope to get your vote on November 8th. Thank you.
Leader of Group 3, we have Leo Pelletier. Thank you. Is it on? Yes, it is. I'd like to take the same man's group here for putting me on the spot tonight. But I'm on the group. Uh, you know, I think um, accessibility, and that's what I'm loaded for. And throughout the city of Fall River, and I'm sure everybody in this room has seen me somewhere. And I'm going to relate just a couple of small stories to you. Three weeks ago, I was going to go, I went to church at St. Joseph. I left for quarter seven in the morning. I'm driving down Main Street. Guy blows the horn. Counselor, I want to talk to you. So I'm going to church. All right, come on, make it fast. Uh, I got a stump on uh, Poker Street. And, uh, you know, the kid tripping over and everything else. I'll see what I can do. I don't know what I can do. We're having trouble taking care of the trees in Fall River, never mind the stumps. So I go to church. I sit down in my pew. Uh, mass is all done. A woman stops me. She says, oh, by the way, Leo, uh, my brother's got a problem on uh, 496 Charles Street. That was a problem. Uh, he's got a couple of holes there to call it three, four times, and they never filled it in. I says, well, let me see what I can do. I called it in. Didn't call the woman back. The next week she said, thank you. It's all set. But I wasn't done yet. I'm walking to my truck. A woman says, Leo, please. I heard you on, a, on TV about GIC, and it's going to cost me more money. I got a fixed income. You got to do something about that. I'll sell, see what I can do. It will be coming up for, oh, I'm sorry. Stop. I wasn't done. <laughs> Next up, we have Ray Mitchell. <laughs> Thank you. He's priceless. <laughs> I want to thank the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association for sponsoring this. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, two years ago, I came before the voters of Fall River, and I asked for your support in electing me to the city council. And I told you, if you elected me, I would work hard. And I think if you look at the two years, I have worked hard. I've worked hard on public safety. I've worked hard on economic development. I've worked hard on trying to rid our city of some of the litter. Um, I, I was one that asked, along with a colleague of mine, to increase the fines. And we increased it from $100 to $300, with $200 going to the police department to help the police department. Recently, we have been working on the uh, fiber optics up at the industrial park. I don't think that Fall River can succeed in its industrial park unless we give every opportunity to business owners, if they move in there, the opportunity to grow at that industrial park. And without fiber optics, you're not going to grow. And so I've worked very hard on that particular issue. Anyone that's followed the last two years know I've worked on various issues, and I'll tell you what, if I'm elected, trust me, I will continue to work as hard as I have the first two years, if not, in fact, harder. I have the desire, and I want to see four of them grow. Thank you very much, and give me a vote. I'd appreciate it. Ronald Cabral. Thank the na uh, say, my name is Ron Cabral. I want to thank the Sinan's neighborhood and all the neighborhood groups that participated tonight. And I'm running for city council because I care about the city. I was born and raised in the city, and I care about the citizens of Fall River. And if I get elected, I will make sure our public safety and our DPW workers and our firefighters are full staff. We don't have to lay any more people in the city of Fall River. Our rate and our play rate is high as it is. If I get elected, I will fight for you. That's why I care about the small business people. I will fight for every little uh, person in this room. It's all about fight and all about teamwork in my campaign. So I can city one year nine votes on September third, on November third, November eight, two thousand eight, two thousand eleven. Sorry. <laughs> David Dennis. As everybody's already said, I want to. Jesus, the stage was me. 
As everybody's already said, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. It, it gives us a real opportunity to meet you and talk to uh, all the voters of the city of Fall River. So thank you. In a very special way, I want to thank the uh, St. Anne's Neighborhood Association uh, for having it at the old DA school because for a young kid who grew up in this neighborhood, this was hallowed ground. I never thought I'd see the inside of this building. So thank you for having it here. So this is one of the things on my bucket list. I finally got to see the inside of Dominican Academy without the nuns. I think in order for to move forward, we have really three challenges before us and we need to solve each one of them. We need to resolve the problem of who and what we want to be as a city. And we need a plan to do that. You can call it a blueprint, you can call it a master plan, you can call it anything you want. But we need a plan that's going to carry us to the next 15, 20 to 30 years. We cannot move this city forward the way we've been doing it. It hasn't worked. We need a plan that we're all going to stick to, succeeding administrations, councils, and everybody in the community. We need that vision. We need a 30-year vision, and we need a plan to get there. It's no different than if a, I ask somebody to build a house for me. They need a blueprint. We need to follow a plan, and we need to implement it now. Second of all, we're going to have to address the problems with our own urban center. We have more people throughout the country. Mo That's it? <laughs> That's it? All right. I'll tell you the rest later. <laughs> Thanks. Pat Casey. I know it. Um, I, uh, my name is Pat Casey. My real name is Patricia, but everybody knows me by Pat. And I'd like to thank the St. Anne's Neighborhood Group and all the other neighborhood groups throughout the city uh, that are involved in having forums and uh, uh, mayor's nights and city councilor nights and school committee nights. Uh, it's very important. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Fall River, and the only time I wasn't here is when I served my uh, country uh, in the U.S. Army Women's Corps, um, and that was a great privilege. But since I've been on the council, I've always felt it a great privilege to be able to serve the people of Fall River. Uh, the fact is we need things to move forward in the city of Fall River, like what's going on right now. The fact of our waterfront, we have the best waterfront from one end of the city of Fall River to the other end, and we have to make the proper use of it. The mayor put in an ordinance, and the full council voted for it to make it easier for businesses to come into the waterfront area. That's what we have to do. We have to develop the waterfront tie it into the uh, main part of the city and make sure that we're all doing everything possible to create jobs and keep them here. We also have to make sure that we support the safety, the police, the fire, and education in the city of Fall River. And with that, thank you very much. We're going to be moving on to our, our umbrella topics, followed by the three different questions for the groups. Um, these questions were selected by members of the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association Board of Directors. Um, and the candidates, the order that you see was pulled randomly um, out, out of a hat. So this was totally random how this fell. The, I'd also like to remind everyone that this is going to be televised too, so we can, we can keep watching this and, and make an informed decision uh, when election day comes. With that, our first topic of the evening is going to be development. And our group one, your question, what tools would you suggest the city or the Fall River Office of Economic Development used to attract businesses specifically to the downtown area of Fall River to enhance that area's economic viability and cultural attraction. We're gonna start with Mike Ramos. Thank you. 
I think I think one of the things that's critical that we do um, for business downtown, but business in, in general throughout the city, but specifically downtown, it, it's fine there. Um, is we need to streamline the way that we do that, the way that we make it for businesses to come into the city to do business. Um, it's a difficult process. It's cumbersome at times. Um, it's not the easiest process when somebody wants to come in and they want to. They have seven different licenses that they have to deal with. Um, they have food handlers licenses. They have liquor licenses. They have building permits, fire department, building department. Um, I think if there, there was a way that we could streamline it, that would be one way. I also think having the um, uh, you know, lick a license at a lower cost, like we, I think we had in place at one time uh, two years ago or four years ago, and I'm not sure if we're still doing it, but that would be another great option because it gives restaurants an opportunity to come into the downtown area at a very low startup cost, um, get a liquor license to provide liquor and wine and uh, other services while they're, uh, for their food customers. And I see my time's up. That comes quick on you that minute. Thank you. Robert DeRogis. Well, this is a tricky question for me. Anyway, uh, low-income housing in this city flourished for many years. Why don't we just do what they did? Advertise, make it easier. When companies want to come in, don't, don't break their backs on licenses and this and that. Make it easy for them. Do whatever they need to be done to come in. Thank you very much. Brad Kilby. <clears throat> yes, uh, first I would state that uh, during my opening I mentioned the fact that when as a counselor I feel it's important to come together as a team, um, I do not hesitate to do that. So I'll point to the waterfront redistricting plan, uh, the rezoning plan of the waterfront that was just passed, 9-0 by the city council. I think by reforming the zoning legislation down the waterfront is the single most uh, important ingredient to now have some development on our waterfront. So that's important. In terms of the four Office of Economic Development, I believe that you need a new marketing strategy. I ran for mayor four years ago, and that was part of my platform. I want the, the, the director of the four Office of Economic Development, excuse me, and much of his staff to be outside Fall River, attracting companies to come to Fall River. Um, thirdly, uh, with our downtown area. Many, many merchants and business owners come to me, as I'm sure they go to many city councils and candidates, with regard to crime downtown. We have to keep downtown clean. We have to keep it crime free. And I think with those steps, we'll be making uh, some progress. Thank you. Bob Booten. Well, in 1965, uh, our family ran an all-night restaurant in Fall River, and one of our biggest problems then was police protection in the evening, and I think in the evening we probably have the same problem now. But our big thing to, is connecting the waterfront. People brag about New Bedford, but they don't have the hill. We need to have public transportation to eat once we have our waterfront developed to get people back and forth from that section. And the parking, the parking is pretty bad. If you've ever had to have jury duty, you know that uh, there's no place to park. You have to pay for the parking garage. You do get a discount. But the biggest thing for any business is parking. We need two, at least two more parking garages. And then people will come and people will invest. But the parking has always been a problem. And the police protection is very important, especially at night. Thank you very much. Linda Pereira. Um, first of all, I think we talked about FROED. Let it be known that the City Council has no control over the Florida Office of Economic Development. We certainly would work with them in a partnership. I've already suggested at a City Council meeting when we've had Ken Fiola there, when you do a road show with different companies and you go to different expos, Take a few counselors with you. Let's talk about Fall River. Let's do a video of Fall River. Let's put it on the internet. There's new technologies. Let's show what Fall River has to offer. When you want to open up businesses downtown, there's a limit on how many liquor licenses you can give out. To be honest with you, I don't understand why beer and wine can't be served anywhere. Maybe we can have um, State Representative Schmidt and Aggie I'll work on that. Maybe uh, get some legislation to open up those doors. I think those are the kinds of partnerships that you need to build. I think there's a lot in Fall River that is worthwhile. We just are too negative and don't promote ourselves appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. 
and Jeff Gregory. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. The most important things about downtown development and all of Fall River, the three basic things. We have to clean up the city, we have to get the crime rate down, and we have to have a better ed education system. We have to get a good amount of foot traffic down there. But we can't have a city council that goes to a 5-4 vote over a lemonade cot. We have to get the little businesses going to create a foot traffic down there. And then mom and pop stores will pop up. There's no big package store that's coming. That, that ship sailed. McQueers and the five and dime stores aren't coming back. We've got to work on getting the small businesses back in Four Rivers, the foundation of economic de development. Thank you. Again, our topic is development, and we're moving on to group two with this question. There have been recent changes in zoning to the Waterfront District. Moving forward, what do you suggest the city and the Fall River Office of Economic Development do to take advantage of these changes and attract businesses and consumers to the Waterfront District? Chris Bartley. I think one of the, the first things that we need to do as a community is to go out to other cities uh, throughout the nation that have done this before, talk to their developers, talk to the people, their elected officials, and learn from their mistakes. Learn what they did right and learn what they did wrong. Um, invite them here. Invite them to see what we have as a, you know, everyone says that our waterfront is our jewel, an economic jewel. Well, it is. And no one was really treating it like that. And I think over the next four years, uh, we are going to have uh, a lackluster time um, in development because of the spaghetti ramps that are Route 79, that construction. So until 2016, not much is, I don't think, not much will happen downtown, um, not, excuse me, not downtown, but on the waterfront. And we need to protect our businesses that we have locally um, so they don't lose business through that construction. Thank you. Mike Mayosa. We are extremely fortunate to have uh, the waterfront that we have. Uh, many communities in America would love to have a waterfront like ours, but unfortunately it is uh, underdeveloped at this time. I think what was mentioned already, I, and I did a press release on this, I think the biggest opportunity for our waterfront is to streamline the permitting process. Uh, right now we've got two beautiful parks. We've got a broad walk down there where there's tons of activity down there. However, you can't even buy a bottle of water or a newspaper. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity, a huge loss of revenue to the city. So we need to make it more uh, business friendly uh, so that we can increase our tax base. And uh, it's an opportunity that uh, has been missed. It looks like uh, the mayor's put this initiative forward. The city council has supported it. So it is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. It's an excellent question. The council did pass the initiative that helps the restrictions and, and easements of the regulations to make the waterfront more accessible. The problem is, if you drive by that waterfront right now, there's four lanes heading in each direction. Two lanes on Duval Street going north, two lanes on Route 79 heading north, two lanes on Duval Street going south, two lanes on 79 going south. In between those lanes, there's areas of grass that belong to the state. Do we really need eight lanes of highway to traverse our waterfront? We don't. All we need to do is lobby our legislators to lobby our Congress to eliminate Route 79 its entirety. Land is at a premium at the waterfront. If we can reduce those eight lanes to two lanes, one or two going north and one or two going south, we will have developed so much more land that we can continue to develop. There are plans in place to try to strategize how we're going to use that land. But right now, the waterfront that we have is land scarce. There's a parcel here, there's a park, there's another little parcel. We need to eliminate those lanes of traffic to create more land so we can fully develop our waterfront. Thank you. Good evening once again. Uh, in regards to waterfront development within the city, I think what we need to do is we, as uh, Joe just spoke about, is the, um, is the spaghetti ramps. We actually, 
which they're working on uh, with the state is bringing those down to, uh, they're getting rid of the eight lanes to uh, four lanes, I believe. And with that, we'll have ac access, better access to the uh, waterfront. We also need to uh, use, utilize the old city pier and m make something with it. And uh, also there's the regatta there that I think it's going to be opening up again. But I think we have a better use for that um, parcel of land. One of the other things we all may be using the city pier as uh, maybe a hotel or something. It's definitely, there's a lot of uh, good ideas I think we can put together uh, to build on the uh, uh, city's waterfront because it's a, there's a lot of communities that would love to have what we have and uh, we just need to make better use of it. And like uh, was said before, there's just find out from other areas, uh, other communities who have did the same thing. I think Weymouth, Massachusetts is another community that's did similar and we just need to build off what they've done, off their successes. Thank you. Eric Cohen. Well, how long have we been talking about waterfront development? Probably the last 30 years, but I'm happy that as chairman of the Ordinance Committee this past year, we stopped talking and we took action. We had hearings, we heard from all, all sides. You can clap, that's fine. <laughs> I won't stop you. Cuts into my time though, but. At the end of the day, we passed some zoning, and it was historic. We've been talking about it for a long time. We finally got something done. So what else needs to be done, though? Florida needs to market the fact that we passed that zone, let people know that we have a new zone, that we want business on our waterfront. So they need to do their job on marketing. We need help from the federal and state government with transportation issues, connecting that waterfront better with the downtown and the rest of the city through lowering the 79 ramps, a project that's been talked about for a long time, but we need to see some action there. And the last thing, streamline permitting. We have a zone, but what people don't realize is there's also still going to be some permitting issues. And we're being asked tomorrow night to vote on what's called a 43D district. And what that means is streamline per permitting. A developer comes in and the city pledges to work with them so that they can obtain all their permits within 180 days. And that's what needs to be done. Thank you. Daniel Rigo. Well, as the man, when he uh, stepped onto the moon, he said that this is one, one step for mankind, if you all remember that. Well, guess what? That's one big step for Fall River kind, for Fall River rights, in my opinion. I think with the zoning change that has just happened, it opens up doors for developers to come into our city. It shouldn't be that hard to reach out to developers. As a matter of fact, I am currently right now working with a gentleman that wants to develop a Taco Bell, and he's the owner of the gas station right there to the right. And he tried to put a proposal together, and he went in front of zoning. He was... It did not happen for him. For one reason or another, there were concerns about park, there was concerns about this, where your car, car is gonna park. We cannot tie the hands of these developers from coming into our city and wanna create jobs. He wanted to create six jobs and he couldn't. I propose that I will reach out to every single developer and assist them in any way that they can. Thank you. We're moving on to group three. Again, the topic is development, and this is the question for our third group. Given the businesses that currently exist in the industrial park, what is your vision for the industrial park, and what steps can be taken to bring that to fruition? Starting with Leo Pelletier. Thank you very much. Uh, in the past, I have proposed at least four or five different companies uh, to come into Fall River. And uh, the Redevelopment Corporation has sat down with quite a few of these companies and never got any way with them. We got one that was uh, E&E &E Metal that bought a piece of land up there. They didn't want no part of them. They took off and they went to Westport, built a $2 million place up there. And we lost the jobs. Sarmento Wine went up there could not get the satisfaction in a piece of land that they needed. So bad, I sat down with the mayor twice, went up to the office, and they never got a personal satisfaction. They turned around and bought a building next to the industrial park. He's got a beautiful place, but he never got any help from Fall River. That's the problem here. You gotta talk to these businesses, 
sit down and work it out. Ray Mitchell. Thank you. As I was stating in my opening statement, we need to give business owners up in our industrial park the tools that are needed to further their businesses up at industrial park. We need also to look at our roads up industrial park. When people come into our city and they want to develop something in our industrial park, many of our roads up there are in deplorable condition. We have got to make our industrial park second to none if we want to attract businesses into our industrial park. I personally feel that we can and will develop our industrial park if we all work together as a body. Just this evening, I received a call from a company that is interested in locating in Fall River, who myself and one of my colleagues talked to earlier this year. And I'll tell you right now, well, my time's up, but I will discuss this later. Thank you. Marla Cabral. I will work with a neighbor, uh, industrial park because without them, that's our main priority in that area. And industrial park, without them, I will fight with every neighborhood. And like I said, with, with my colleagues, whoever got to city council, because without them, and I work with the mayor, without, it's the backbone of our city. We need more jobs in this city. You're going to have, uh, we were three times a month. I'll bring them to the city council. I'll talk with the development board. We have to work together as a team. And that's what I'll do. I'll work as a team with Industrial Park to bring success for jobs in the city of Fall River. David Dennis. I've, re I've repeatedly said that education equals economic development equals jobs. Until we fix educational attainment in the city of Fall River, we are going to continue to have difficulty attracting companies to come to the city of Fall River. A few weeks ago, there was an article in the Providence Journal done by the Brookings Institute. They identified Fall River, once again, as lacking in educational attainment. Unless we fix the schools in the city of Fall River, we are not going to get the kind of jobs that we deserve. It will not happen. The beginning of economic development begins in the school systems. That's where it begins. If we fix that, we'll fill the industrial park. Thank you. Pat Casey. Thank you. Uh, just recently, A.J. Wright uh, left the industrial park. But um, it was just a few weeks back that we were up uh, at a press conference announcing that the company from uh, Cranston was uh, buying that property, taking it over, and going to create jobs. These are things that we have to continue to support. New businesses coming into the city and doing everything we can to keep businesses uh, here, keep them here. Uh, Light Alier just announced that they're going to put up a wind turbine. Uh, they've already started the digging for it and all that. This is something as counselors uh, we must uh, continue to support because this here is going to bring their expenses down, which means they possibly can hire more people. And that's the way we have to do. Make sure any business that's having any problems up there, that we address them to the best that we can. Thank you. We're going to move, be moving on to our second topic. and. Um, just to preface this, uh, as an active member of the St. Anne's no Neighborhood Association, this particular topic is especially important to myself, uh, many of the people here tonight, and with an expanding number of citizens here in the city of Fall River. And in attendance tonight, we do have many representatives from the associations within our city. Uh, the topic is going to be neighborhood associations. For the first group, 
our question is, in your opinion, what is the role of the neighborhood associations in the city, and how would you foster a working relationship with the city council? We're starting with Mike Ramos. Awesome question. Um, I'm an active member of my neighborhood association, and I always have been. That's the Maplewood Neighborhood, neighborhood uh, Hood Association. Um, I think neighborhood associations are critical to the city of Fort Worth, critical to the neighborhoods, because what they do is they're the ears and the eyes of the neighborhood when the police department is struggling with cuts and lack of funding and they're down police offices. Well, in my neighborhood, my aunt specifically, she knows every license plate number of every person that lives three blocks this way and three blocks that way. She knows who lives in which house, and she'll call me and say, Mike, I don't know if that person belongs there or not, and I don't know if that person belongs there, and you know, you better call, call the police. I think they might be up to something. I think that that's critical, and I think the residents of this city are the only people who know the city that well. The, the actual neighborhood residents are the ones who know. So um, I, I think the neighborhood associations are awesome, um, and I've seen actually a a huge increase in the participation of the neighborhood associations in the past four or five years. And I think that that's also going to be critical to the success of the city of Forva, um, especially when we're struggling in so many ways, other ways. Thank you. Robert DeRogis. I haven't had much opportunity to deal with anybody with neighborhood associations due to where I live. We never really had one. Um, but I was able to sit in a few of them recently, and I thought they were wonderful. I think it's great. It tells you a little about what's going on in the neighborhood, and, you, and it also lets you know what's going on in the city. Um, I just uh, think that it's a wonderful thing. And, I, and as a city councilman, I would try to make every effort I can to visit all neighborhood meetings uh, as often as I could. I mean, that's what else can I tell you? Brad Kilby. Thank you. Um, as Mike has stated, he's absolutely correct. Um, neighborhood associations are vital uh, to any community. When people stop caring in your community, the 10,000 people who voted in the primary, that's an example. When people stop caring, your community is doomed. So in my eyes, the way I feel, I, matter of fact, I, I give this administration, Philanthropy administration, a lot of credit because I think he has really fostered a strong relationship with, with neighborhood groups. He really has. One, one other vital ingredient, and I could please take it from experience, commu uh, community groups hold elected officials accountable. They really do. They bring issues forth that are important to their specific neighborhood, and the issues are different, whether it's traffic or whether it's crime, whether it's litter. Um, we have a vast number of groups uh, that are very, very effective. The first neighborhood group that I played part of and helped out was founded by Pat Casey. She, uh, 15 years ago, and I think she was a pioneer in that regard. So thank you. Bob Booten. Neighborhood associations are the basic of American democracy. You have every John Doe and Jane Doe that comes, can, can come in and they can voice their own opinion. They, the, most of those association meetings that I've been to, there has been policemen. They've been able to speak with the policemen about what's happening in their neighborhood uh, with gangs, with drugs, etc. And it's just the American way. You have to, it was in the 70s when I first, we were started to do a, a, an association up in the Flint and it didn't catch that well, and now it's going very well. Uh, without the associations, we would be losing quite a bit. They wind up cleaning the area, they keep, uh, it's pride. Uh, it's, just, it's just the way we have to go if we want to continue the involvement. Thank you. Linda Pereira. We've had a neighborhood group on my street since I was 13 years old, so that was a long time ago before any of these neighborhood groups. It was people taking care of people, people helping people. And I think that the neighborhood groups in, in the city of Fall River have done a lot for our community. The unfortunate thing for me is that I work 40 hours a week and have a life of a bunch of things that I have to do at night. So for me to get to every neighborhood association meeting on a monthly basis is quite frankly not possible. 
and that's bothersome to me. I think what needs to happen is all of the neighborhoods need to form a neighborhood council that meets monthly at some location in City Hall um, on the same night or on a different night than a city council meeting so that we can all hear what's going on. There's all kinds of neighborhood groups that go on. Do you know that in Florida, the neighborhood groups there get $25 from each neighbor? They match money for grants to get things? I've never heard of that. Um, but there's a lot that can be done with that, and I certainly would applaud the people because you're trying to make Fall River better. Jeff Gregory. Again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think the neighborhood associations are a very important part of our city. A lot of things wouldn't have got done in the last two years without the growth of the neighborhood associations. Matter of fact, I've been telling Pam and Aaron from the St. Anne's Association to slow down before they burn themselves out. Uh, what do you call it? I attend as many, as many of the meetings as possible. And what do you call it? Some of the events that they've put on, the movie nights, the car shows. Uh, Father Kelly Park has a family fun day coming up. This is, what, this is what's needed in our community, to bring the community together. And that's where volunteerism starts. That's how our parks get cleaned. That's how our streets get cleaned. It, it doesn't matter what financial condition the city's in. We need volunteerism all the time in every community. Thank you. We're moving on to group two. Again, the topic is neighborhood associations, and this is the question for group two. How important do you think it is for counselors to attend neighborhood meetings, and how many meetings have you attended this year? Starting with Chris Bartley. Uh, first off, I'm not a counselor, but I, I regularly attend a lot of the neighborhood association meetings. Uh, I happen to be a member of the North End Neighborhood Association, and I am on the board of directors of the Lower Highlands Neighborhood Association. Two neighborhood groups that I'm heavily involved in, one that I grew up in and one that I currently live in now. And I think it's vital to have the counselors there. They really need to see what's going on and what's happening in the neighborhoods. And the only way to do that is to do it by, by attending, the, um, attending the meetings. Perception is very, very important. We just talked about economic development. And the only way to change that perception in the city is to get involved in your neighborhood group, clean the sidewalk in front of your house, ask your neighbor to clean their sidewalk in front of their house, and get involved. Thank you. Mike Maioza. I think there was a two-part question was how many uh, neighborhood association meetings have uh, counselors attended. Uh, obviously, I'm not a counselor, but I've made every effort to attend as many neighborhood association uh, meetings as possible because to me, this is where you're going to find out what is happening in the community. I've actually, over the summer, had invited the neighborhood associations over to my house to learn firsthand what the issues were. Uh, additionally, uh, as I did some research, uh, I found out that there was not a liaison from the city council to the neighborhood associations, and that kind of distressed me. Uh, so what, I'm, what I've advocated for is that we have a liaison uh, that meets regularly with the neighborhood associations. So tonight, I would like to challenge the incumbents uh, to uh, make a resolution to create that uh, liaison position and don't wait for me to get on the city council to do it. Thank you. Joe Camara. As far as 10 neighborhood associations, I've been to 100 neighborhood associations throughout my career. Just a couple of weeks ago, Council Pelletier, Council Casey, myself, Council Poulin, we were at the um, Maple Neighborhood Association at Laterno School. And as was mentioned earlier, the neighborhoods are wonderful, and people have the time to spend and go to those meetings, it's one thing. But in my neighborhood, most of my neighbors, I don't think have ever attended a neighborhood association meeting. They have children, they're hardworking people, they just want to spend time getting to know their families instead of going to a neighborhood association on occasions. But it's crucial that the neighborhood associations stay intact because they do provide a very valuable service to the community. We touch base with the Florida Police Department. 
We talk to the police officers that attend these neighborhood meetings on a regular basis, and they provide a valuable service. I know many of them do attend. The neighborhoods do provide a very important role, but as I mentioned earlier, not everyone can attend all the time, and the examples that problems that exist in one neighborhood are not really different from the problems that exist throughout the city and all the other neighborhoods. It's all about public safety and providing city services to all the neighborhoods evenly. Thank you. Paul De Silva. Uh, regarding the first question about how important the neighborhood associations are, uh, they're very important. If you've seen over the last few years, I think uh, there's been many uh, neighborhood uh, organizations that have grown, especially uh, the St. Anne's Neighborhood Association, which I'm a proud member of and on the, on the board. Um, they, it was since uh, December, December of last year was when they became, and here we are today in a forum. Uh, so I think it's very, very important. As one neighborhood leader has said for many, who I've heard a lot of times, is they're the eyes and ears of this city. And it, it's, you can, they all get together. There's issues. I was just at a meeting. Uh, it was last week in the Flint, and there was um, someone had discussed with a police officer that was there that there was some illegal activity going on. Here you are. The next day, at about 4 o'clock in the morning, Massachusetts State Police were there. They arrested two gentlemen that had warrants, and they were off the streets. So it's definitely, and that's, what, that's how quick it happened. Within less than 24 hours, you had someone that was arrested and behind bars. Uh, and regarding the attendance, I go to as many as possible, and I think many of the uh, Associate Presidents can attest to that. Thank you. Eric Pullen. How important it is to attend neighborhood meetings, very important. And this is one instance where I've not only talked the talk, but I've walked to walk. And I say with every degree of, uh, with, with no degree of pride and vanity and every degree of humility that I'm going for the Guinness record. How many have I attended? I couldn't even begin to tell you, and you know because you've all seen me at the meetings. And look, I know we're all, we're all busy and not everyone can attend, but you always have the time to pick up the phone and call a neighborhood leader or send an email. There's other ways to communicate with people besides attending, but I have good relationships with many of the neighborhood leaders, all the neighborhood leaders. I'm proud of those, and I'm proud that I'm going to be taking up Mike Myo's honest challenge and filing that resolution to call for a liaison from the council to the neighborhood associations. Any of my colleagues that want to join me can co-sponsor. Thank you. Daniel Rigo. All right, uh, as far as how many have I attended, well, I gotta be honest, I haven't attended many, but I've attended a few. But most importantly, it's if you pay attention to them or not. When you see neighborhood associations actively seeking help and asking for help, City councilors should be there, the administration should be there, the public works department should be there. You need to target the people of your issues and ask them to come. But with that being said, I'm also the chairman of a volunteer organizing committee that are currently made up of the members out of my union. And what we do is we do things like we build a concession stand for BMC Durfee High School for no charge for our kids to have that. I'm also heavily involved with building handicap ramps for people that don't have the funds to build handicap ramps. That's part of being an association. Neighborhood associations are very, very important, and I will always be there for each and every one of you if, if and when I'm elected. Thank you. to group three again topic is neighborhood associations and this is the question for our final group what is your current relationship with the neighborhood associations in the city and what would you do to maintain or improve this relationship starting with Leo Pelletier thank you uh, I think it's very important that we have the neighborhood association I've been to several uh, Maplewood Latino School, uh, Our Lady of God, and uh, there's a lot of good that comes out of it. And a lot of times, uh, you find out the problems in the neighborhood, 
and you can rectify them. Uh, we've had people that, you know, talk to me that we have a drug problem in their neighborhood. Of course, uh, the police department is there as well. And, you know, I sit down with the police department when it has, when I have to sit with them if I got something to say private to them. People tell me stuff uh, no matter where I go. It doesn't have to be from the neighborhood association because I'm all over the city of Fall River and whatever I, complaints I get is from the neighborhoods. And if I have to go to the police department or the public works or the mayor, that's what I do. But the best thing going for Fall River is the neighborhood associations. Thank you. Ray Mitchell. Thank you. Well, I think I too have walked the walk. Uh, I go to many of the neighborhood associations. I have a very good relationship with most of the neighborhood associations, if not all. And I've been involved in cleanups with the neighborhood associations. I've uh, helped them with uh, movie nights and various other activities. And I feel that the neighborhood associations are the backbone of our community. Each neighborhood is unique in that they have different problems. Each neighborhood has its own little series of problems. And by going to those neighborhood association meetings, you get a first-hand look at what's happening in that neighborhood. And you can be, an, as a city councilor, you can be an active partner in resolving those issues. I've been involved in the, uh, with the neighborhoods and I will continue to be because I think those neighborhood associations are the greatest things that come to our city. Thank you very much. Lionel Cabral. I can tell you, I will work with the uh, neighbor associations. I will tell you what, Mike Mazzoza, to go to the I mean, various community service events in the city, do come out of your service. I will team up with all of you to bring community a safer and clean parks and all this in our community. We work together as a team. And thank you, and I will join Mike Rola and draw that teamwork. That's what I just need. David Dennis. For many, many years, I've worked cooperatively with uh, all of the neighborhood associations throughout the years. I've been very happy to see that the Navy associations have grown in number, uh, and I understand uh, that it is a, uh, it's a nice gesture to be able to su suggest that we get out to all these neighborhood associations, but the, but the honest answer is, is that we all work. I know I do. Uh, and we all belong to, at least, at least I do anyway, we belong to many other organizations, and it isn't always possible to get to every single one every single month. But I've certainly donated countless hours personally, and I've also donated many hours professionally to the, uh, to the uh, neighborhood associations. They're important in our community. Uh, they help stitch together uh, all parts of our city. You know, we are a city of which parish did you grow up in? What neighborhood did you grow up in? The Maplewood, I happen to grow up here. I always say I grew up in, uh, you know, the South Park, the Corky Row. So neighborhood associations have had a, played a very important role in stitching our city together and we need to work cooperatively with them, develop partnerships, and collaborate with them whenever possible. And I think uh, everybody on this stage is willing to do that, and I certainly want to do, to do that, too. Thank you. Pat Casey. Thank you. Um, I go way back with the neighborhood. Uh, we started our neighborhood group, uh, the Sandy Beach uh, Association, uh, I guess it was over 20 years ago. And the reason we started it, because there was a lot of elderly people in our neighborhood, and we wanted to make sure that they were watched over and protected. And to me, every neighborhood in the city of Four River is most important to work with the police department, being the eyes and ears, and I'm going to steal a little something off Natalie from the uh, Bank Street neighborhood. As she states it, and a lot of us have stated it after, a clean neighborhood is a safe neighborhood. I, thank you. 
I've been involved with every one of the neighborhoods from the north end all the way up to the neighborhood that I belong to. And uh, it is something that makes all of us work together, whether we're involved in helping a neighborhood clean up or not. But I just wanted to bring one thing out fast. The uh, uh, St. Anne's Neighborhood Group is going to be working on the beach because I'm going to push that until we have a beach on our waterfront. We're moving on to our third topic of the evening, and this is something... Sure. Sure. <laughs> should, should we take a three minute break? All right, three, three, three minute break. First question presented to group one. If given the opportunity to change this year's budget process, what would you change and why? Starting with Mike Ramos. Just, you know, I think budgets are as simple as they are complicated. It's simple. Money in, money out. If you have $1,000 in your checking account, that's what you spend. If you, have, if you don't have that, then you don't spend it. But that's not what city, state, or federal government does. We just have blank checks, and we keep on writing them and writing them and writing them at the taxpayers' and the business payers' expense because it's tax money that ends up, you know, um, bearing the brunt and the burden of that, the taxpayers'. Um, as far as the actual budget goes, I don't think we need to look at the budget and see what we need to do to replace the money or the budget or the shortfalls if we come up with some creative ways and of coming up with new re sources of revenue. And that's one of the things that I recently uh, did a press conference down on the waterfront. It was two days ago, as a matter of fact, and the Herald News did a piece. And uh, basically what I did was a case study between Portland, Maine. I spoke with Greg Mitchell, who's the Director of Office of Economic Development in Portland, Maine. And I compared how Portland, Maine, a city of 60,000 people, which pales in comparison to Fall River, a waterfront, waterfront less than us, realized $26 million of revenue. $26 million in one year. You know what? If we do the same thing, we don't have to worry about our budget. We'll have all the money in the world for teachers, for police, for fire. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to repeat the question one more time. Um, if given the opportunity to change this year's budget process, what would you change and why? Robert DeRogis? Well, I've never had the opportunity to sit in on a budget and how it is done. So I couldn't really give you an answer on how to change it. Sorry. Brad Kilby? Yes, thank you. Um, I wouldn't change anything. I thought the, the budget process this last time around worked the way it was supposed to work. And I'm not talking about money. What I'm talking about is my role as a city council, working with the mayor, and going over what I think priorities in the city are. First, we get a copy of the school budget and the city budget. We, stu we study that budget cover to cover. Second, uh, thirdly, or secondly, I should say, we have our meetings with the administration and go over what our priorities are. And this time, the mayor was going to take some educational money and use it for other areas, and he asked me directly, would you support the budget? I said, no, I can't. We have to meet our minimum educational requirements in this city. That's what I said. M many of the, my other colleagues on the city council have said the same thing. The votes weren't there to pass it. The mayor compromised. The vote passed, the budget passed, I should say. More money went to education. We met net school spending. So in my mind, the process worked this time. I'm not talking about the amount of money that's going to the schools or going to public safety or going to public works. Different issue. The process, yes, it did. It worked, and, uh, and it worked the way it was supposed to work. So thank you. Bob Bruton. I haven't been, had the opportunity to actually uh, go over the city budget because I'm not a counselor, but I did have 12 years of budget with the water board and our biggest problem there was not getting the information right. We would always get the budget at the last minute and we would have to approve the budget or it was going to hold up the tax rate. So uh, I think one of the most important things for any budget is to get the actual budget to the counselors on time so that they can review it. And I think extra time is uh, what is always needed on a budget. So you can go through it, you can ask your questions, and then you can have what I call an informed decision on what you're going to do. Thank you. 
you have a thought? <clears throat> well, I think that the budget is the way that the city charter is. The budget is based on checks and balances. So it's a very hypothetical question if you wanted to change it some other way. Quite frankly, you can't unless you change a charter. What I can tell you is last year's budget, I questioned the retirement money because I knew we weren't putting in enough. And I was told by the treasurer at that time, Mr. Grab, that I was, I was wrong. The state allowed us to extend our payments. Well, when I requested a meeting with DLR and I invited all my colleagues to come up to Boston with me, I was right. They didn't put in enough money. So this year, more money had to be put into the budget for retirement. So I don't know about you, but when I retire, I want to make sure that my money is there. And that's part of my job, is to watch out for you. And if I don't think something is right, there's always another way to look into it. And with the assistance of my colleagues and going to Boston to DOR, a wrong was made right. Thank you. Jeff Gregory. Good evening, again, ladies and gentlemen. This is an article from the Herald News back in 2009. It compared the two budget crises Mayor Carrera went through and Mayor Lambert went through. I was during Mayor Lambert's time as head of the police union. What it says, and anyone can look at it after, we prioritized the cuts that were made in the city budget. The priority was to save the city services for the citizens. There were no cuts to cities, city services for the citizens that year. We had more of a gap and less money to work with. There's no reason in the world that, what do you call it, the city budget can't have a full complement of police and fire, DPW, and the school department fully funded if you go with the zero bun budget and they're budgeted first. Thank you. We're moving on to group two. Again, the topic is budget. The question is, what areas in this year's budget do you feel should be reduced and why? And why did you apply those savings? Starting with Chris Bartley. I think one of the areas that we need to look at uh, in terms of uh, creating revenue or eliminating redundant services or spending is to just over across the board look at all of our departments and possibly either consolidate some departments. I think there might be some unnecessary uh, levels that we can uh, remove. Uh, I'd also be interested in looking at uh, re regionalization of some services uh, and purchasing as long as there wouldn't be any jobs, um, jobs eliminated in that process. But overall, I think there's room as long as we, we need to look, look through the budget and find it. Uh, and again, reduce and eliminate any redundant spending. Thank you. Uh, the question in those areas to reduce and why I've not really had a chance to review the budget, so I'm not sure if there is any fat or any opportunity in the budget. But just like our house, household budget, there's two ways uh, that you can get rid of You can reduce your expenses or you can uh, bring in more money. Uh, I'm not really uh, a fan of raising taxes, so I think we need to do a, a budget review, a line by line budget review and find out if there's any fat in the budget and then prioritize what are our prior priorities. Obviously, I think, you know, listening to the community, one of our pri priorities is public safety, whether it be police, whether it be fire. So I think there's a, a review of the budget that needs to happen, uh, see if there's any fat, and if there uh, is, uh, you know, take that money and use it where we think the priorities lie. Thank you. Joe Camara. Well, one of the departments that increased in their budget was the law department, and I think we need to scale back the law department. A lot of that work's being subbed out and uh, being hired attorneys to do different things. We are going to save a lot of money because we used to have a certain account set up in the budget in the law department to fight LNG. Thank God that's over with, and now we can save that money and put it to better use. But getting back to the other problem, what we need to do is analyze what we're paying in overtime accounts and public works and police, and as to what that would cost if we just hired more people in those departments. 
There was, a, there was a reduction in public works. We laid off quite a few pub, people in the public works department, but now the cost that we were supposed to save is skyrocketing because the, over account, the overtime accounts have gone up. So you need to do an analysis as to what you're actually saving by having a, redu a reduction in those departments as to what you could save if you hired more people to begin with. The overtime accounts wouldn't be that much. So it's something we need to analyze how that money is being spent. Thank you. Paul De Silva. Uh, in regards to the uh, areas that would need to be looking at cuts, I, I, I think we really should look at like a zero-based budgeting and, and fund those areas that we see that are most important, most likely police, fire, as well as DPW, and uh, look at all those services and what we think is most important to us as residents. Uh, some areas where we'd want to look at is re the redundancies, whether it's maybe um, areas of uh, uh, repair of uh, city-owned vehicles, whether it's police, fire, as well as the DPW. Uh, there's also other areas such as um, DPW in the parks and cemetery, do we combine those? There's a, which is, actually was a topic on WSAR recently. Uh, so there's definitely ways we can look at, uh, say, looking at the budget as a whole, which I unfortunately didn't have a chance to look at the budget. But I think there's definitely ways we need to look at the budget line by line and then just go from there. Thank you. Eric Pullen. Thank you. Well, I don't like the fact that we're spending two hundred fifty to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year on maintaining vacant school buildings. That's that's one. We got to get those back on the tax rolls. I could stand up here and, and nitpick different departments, but the bottom line is the answer is relatively easy. You got to look at what your budget busters are. Budget busters are your health care, your prescription drugs. In that regard, the city council will soon be taking up health care reform, uh, working along with the administration. We're looking to that arena. There'll hopefully be millions in savings there. And then we're, I've also proposed, along with one of my colleagues, some reforms to with the way that the city pays for prescription drugs. Uh, right now, the process is not working in the city's favor. And those things can be done without hurting our employees. And that's where you've got to look. You've got to look at the budget busters. And where would I put those hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in savings? The first area I'd look to put it is putting police officers back on the streets of the city of Fall River. Daniel Riga. Well, I too, like the rest of uh, my colleagues that are running for city council, uh, question, you know, uh, the status of a budget. But, you know, when you really think about it, do we have a balanced budget? Do we know what we have in the checking account? I don't know. I think, first of all, before we can make any decisions based upon any pros and cons, we need to audit the budget. We need to bring an independent outside auditor to audit the budget. This way we know exactly how much money we have to play within to date. I believe we don't have that. So to say we're going to cut here and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, we can't be doing that no more. We cannot base our judgments on assumptions of money that is coming down the pike because it may, may or may not come here. We need to create a balanced budget, and then go from there, in my opinion. Thank you. We're moving on to group three with the uh, topic of the budget. And um, for this particular question, we're going to give you a list of four segments of the budget. And those would be schools, public safety, economic development, and the DPW. And we want to know what areas of would you fund first, second, third, fourth, and why? So me, right? Leo Pelletier. Four, four things again. School, fire. Schools. Public safety, economic development, and Department of Public Works. I would have to go with... Uh, Fire, police, schools, in the late, last one, in order. Economic development? Yeah. And, and why? Well, you know, first of all, when you see all the problems that you have in the city of Fall River, with all these people coming in, and a lot of times you read the paper, it's always Hispanics, it's they're in trouble, starting trouble, all kinds of stuff. You need the police department. You also need the fire department, very important as well. 
You need jobs as well. Uh, so, you, you know, the whole thing is a package. You got to work together and bring the monies in, just like the school department. You got to educate the kids. And uh, the school department's budget's about a $100 million. And, you know, you turn around, what can I do to help these guys out? They don't want to hear from me. This is my budget. Stay out of it. Mind your own business. That's just some of the answers we get when we talk to the school department. But whatever we can do, whatever I can do, I will do. Make sure the city moves on. Thank you. Ray Mitchell. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, it would be a toss-up between education and public safety because we need so, uh, both so greatly. Education, if we're ever going to move our city forward, education is going to be the key. And we need to ensure that education is funded each and every year. At the same time, we need public safety. As we stated, many people have stated here this evening, if we are going to prosper in our city, we need to ensure that we have adequate public safety in our community. Because if we're asking people to move into our community, we've got to ensure their safety. Now, between the Office of Economic Development and the DPW, I think that it's essential that we keep both of those, and I would say they're both on par. And the reason I would say they're both on par is we need our DPW. Certainly, you can't be serious. Well, anyhow, we need the DPW and we need the Office of Economic Development to bring jobs into our community. Thank you. Ronald Cabral. Public safety, uh, that's main priority. To get more police officers back on our street, to get a full force once again. Economic development, work with the for economic development to bring jobs to our city. And we care about, I care about the city of Fort Worth, and that's why I run for city council, to work with these colleagues on city council for public safety and economic development and DPW. I'll make sure a DPW work will not get laid off and hire more DPW for our parks. Thank you. David Dennis. I think I've said many times uh, in the coffee hours that I've had, it's a pretty simple formula. My formula is, Education equals economic development equals jobs equals revenue for the city. So, if we spend the money we need to on education, if we fully fund education, that will generate people who have the skills to encourage companies to move into the city of Fort River. That's economic development. Those companies will employ people. Those people that employed will generate additional re revenue for the city, will increase our tax base, and in doing that, we'll have all the money we need for public safety and DPW. Thank you. Pat Casey. I guess I'm getting shorter here. I have to keep moving it after he's on. Uh, the fact is uh, you asked um, to state which one we thought was most important. I can't honestly stand in front of you people or the people of Fall River and tell you which one is the most important. Schools are the most important. We must educate our children to prepare them for the future. Public safety, without having our streets safe to walk, nobody's gonna be walking to school and nobody's gonna be enjoying the safety that the city deserves. DPW, number one, two, all of them are number one. If we don't have our trash picked up and our city streets plowed and our city streets being addressed properly, then we have no Fall River. With economic development, if we don't develop our city and fight for what we deserve, there will be no city. So all of them are number one. Our final topic for the evening is going to be more personal questions for the candidates. Starting with group one, your question, uh, we'd like to know what is your biggest personal accomplishment in the city of Fall River, starting with Mike Ramos. Thank you. 
Um, I think establishing the Teens Helping Teens group at Durfee High School, um, mostly because people told me that it couldn't be done, and I think that's one of the things I pride myself on, is not taking that as an answer. I went to Durfee High School and I said, I know that there's some kids here that are attending class and they have parents that are addicted to substances and alcohol, and that problem has only gotten worse. And I said, I think there's a, a need for a self-help group and maybe we could put something like that together. And I'm willing to volunteer my time, not because I was running for city council, because I did this years ago before I knew that I was gonna be a candidate for city council, but because it mattered and because it was important. Um, so I went there and they said, you know, it, it can't be done. It, we've tried it, people have tried it, we can't do it. Um, I approached Nathalie Kaufman, who was the adjustment counselor at the time, and um, Marilyn Rod Roderick, who is um, a school co currently a school committee woman, and I said, you know, I really wanna get this in, can you help me? And I knew they had some connections in the school, and the first group, we had about 90 kids show up. Um, it was an amazing group. It ran for about three years, helped about 500 kids, and the entire cost of it was $30. I think I'm most proud of it because it, people told me it couldn't be done. Proud because it helped so many young people, and most of all, because it cost 30 bucks. Thank you. Robert DeRoges. What is your biggest personal accomplishment in the city of Fall River? Uh, let's see. Growing up in Fall River, uh, and in my eyes, succeeding, going from an apartment house, building my own home, and raising my children. That's all I get to tell you. Brad Kilby. Uh, beyond being a very, very lucky individual with the family that I have, my wife and three children, I, that's definitely is the proudest uh, thing that I think I've, my wife and I have created. In public office, that's an easy one as well. Um, a number of years ago, 10, 13 years ago, I was the first or one of the first elected officials to talk about new school construction. Um, the fact that the state would reimburse the city for over 90% um, on c school construction projects. Councilor Kamara was also part of that effort. Um, it's ironic, somewhat ironic, but when I drive by the old Morton Middle School, which is now being demolished, that was the first press conference that we held 12, 13 years ago in the courtyard where Mayor Lambert, Superintendent Gibney, Kamara, and, and some others with, were there, and talking about this, this great plan that we have to improve our school system and our school buildings, with that 90% payback from the state. It's happened, we have the new schools, we're trying to sell the old ones now, but I must say that is uh, a very, it's something I'll remember for the rest of my life, thank you. Bob Booten. Well, as far as personal accomplishments, of course I've been in business 38 years, right here in Fall River, I came back in 1971 and invested every dime I had into uh, my apartment buildings, which burnt to the ground in 1982, and I stayed here. But one of the biggest things is I've tried my best to help the children of the city of Fall River as an instructor for junior achievement. I've helped Dr. Fratkin with his American Dream Challenge program, which I'm very proud of, uh, and scouting. Uh, as a water commissioner, that's a voluntary position for 12 years, and I feel that I helped the quality of the water and to preserve the reservation when we wound up uh, joining the state so we could get the um, uh, 300 acres for the bio park. But the number one, besides my son and wife, who I feel are my number one priorities, I've had the uh, pleasure of helping to raise 13 grandchildren, and I'm very proud of all of them. Okay, I guess that uh, one of my proudest accomplishments was being the first one in my family to graduate from college because that was important to my parents, um, to be educated. So that is important to me. My family is very important to me. My husband of 38 years is important to me. Marriage and families today, it's tough. There's ups and downs. And after 38 years, believe me, there's been ups and downs. You'll work at it. And I think that that makes you a stronger person. Um, as far as being on the city council, I put together the Committee for Health and Human Services and was instrumental in having the first Durfee um, after prom party. And the way I looked at it, if we saved one life, it was worth it. And putting together the commission 
on people with disabilities because I think that that's a segment of our community that we cannot ignore. My life has been around children and making sure that they're safe. If they're safe, that means we're all gonna be safe. Thank you. Jeff Gregory. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost over. It was kind of odd today that this would come out in the Herald News about the health insurance. City option would bypass collective bargaining. Because back in 2001, that's exactly how I blocked Blue Cross from charging the city so much money. They used to arbitrarily come to the city and say we want an 18% increase and the city just go for it. I filed a report as being head of the police union. The city followed suit and the other unions followed suit where they had to include us in the process of uh, what increases came down every year. This process that became intact over the next several years saved this city over $8 million. What do you call it? The prescription plan is the same as it was when I left. The people don't think I know what I'm talking about. After I was retired, I filed a letter in the Herald News about stop backdoor deals and take on Blue Cross as I did. And well, just to finish up, the vice president sent a rebuttal in, not the representative. They were so ticked off about it. Thank you. Moving on to group two, and the question is, what is it specifically that made you want to run for city council, starting with Chris Bartley? I think the main reason why I decided to run for city council two years ago, this is my second try, uh, was I have a little five-year-old boy, and me and my wife pretty much decided to, if we were gonna stay in Fall River, we needed to get active in the community. And I took it to the level uh, to where I am now, standing here in front of you all, running for city council. I wanted to make sure that I provided, or I tried to provide a better environment, a better future for my little son, and also for everyone else in the city. Uh, I'm the type of person where, if I see something wrong, I gotta advocate to stop it. And th that's pretty much uh, the reason why I, I run for city council. Uh, and again, I ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Mike Maioza. Nine or 10 years ago, I never envisioned that I'd be standing here in front of you uh, asking for your vote, running for uh, an elected office, but it was the, uh, my decision nine years ago to take on a giant corporation with many of you in this room, many of the elected officials here, and uh, to fight that LNG uh, terminal. Uh, so that's what motivated me to get into politics. And one of the things I will do is take that same energy uh, and bring that energy to the city council to go after some of the issues that we, uh, we, we have in front of us. I also want to take this opportunity, because many may not re re uh, realize this, but the reason we were successful in, in stopping that, uh, one of the primary reasons, I think, was that there was a young administrator in Mayor Lambert's office named Eric Poulin, who was given the mayor very good information to help us stop uh, fighting that LNG. I hope you consider me for one of your nine votes uh, on November 8th, and thanks for listening to us tonight. Thank you. Joe Camara. Thank you, it's an excellent question. When I first decided to run for office, I just recently been married, my daughter was a year old, and I just built a brand new house. And I knew that Fall River was where I wanted to live for the rest of my life. My wife knew it as well. My entire family is from this city. My wife's entire family is from the city. All of my friends have grown up here, and I wanted them to keep staying here and have a place that they could raise their children and stay in this community. When I ran for office, the city was not recycling. Not only did we have a landfill, but we had an incinerator. We had a number of things that we were not doing. And as I started to pay more and more attention, I realized that I wanted to work hard to make a difference. As Council Kilby said earlier, we hadn't built a brand new school in the longest time. So I decided to run for office to make some of the positive changes. And now, after being in office, we are recycling. 
We implemented that policy. There was a young man named Mayor Lambert at the time who was also running, so I saw a new administration coming into play with a new council. We could get a lot done. We started the recycling. We built new schools. We made a lot of changes in this community. We created a new industrial park, and now we're creating a second industrial park with the bio park. That's one of the reasons I ran for office. Thank you very much. And with that, I just want to say on November 8th, I also ask for one of your nine votes. Thank you very much. Paul De Silva. Great question. Why did I run for city council? Well, it's pretty simple. I was, uh, my parents came here for opportunity uh, over 30 years ago, and I truly do love this community. I don't plan on going anywhere else. Uh, I've been, was born here, and uh, I really do care about the city. I just want four of it to be a safe, clean community where I can raise a family where I don't have one now, but that's ultimately why I, I, um, I'm running for office. I truly care about this city, and I'm really involved in it, and I want to see it to be successful in my lifetime. So on November 8th, I respectfully ask for one of your nine votes. Thank you. Eric Pullen. It's funny because you get asked this question a lot. People come up to you and they say, why on earth are you running for public office? And almost like there's something wrong with you in a way sometimes the way people ask you. Uh, but the reason I'm running very simply is I'm running for all of you. And I say that with every degree of sincerity because to be honest with you, I don't really like politics. It gets very nasty at times. It gets messy. There's a lot of people that don't get involved, that nitpick every single thing you do. I know a lot of the neighborhood leaders know what I'm talking about, but if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So you've got to get involved if you want to make a difference in your city and move it forward. And that's why I am involved. And you know what? I'll always fight for what I believe, based on my research, is the best for the citizens of Fall River. And if that means getting beat up sometimes by people on the Herald News side or call us to the radio or whatever you have to do, that goes with this business. You have to have a tough skin. But I do it because I love Fall River. I love all of you. We're going to continue to work together and move this city forward. Have a good night. Daniel Rigo. Well, I got to tell you, that's uh, you know, a, a very heartfelt question when you ask me. Uh, being the youngest of 14, and when I came to this country in 1971, I was five years old. I came here with no shoes on my feet. And uh, thank God I had nine beautiful sisters that raised me in this city. With that being said, in 2005, I had a tragic accident. I fell off a roof to my death. And throughout that time, I laid in a hospital bed for a month in a trauma unit in Providence, Rhode Island, not knowing whether or not I was going to lose my right extremity or not. But you know something? I prayed and I promised God that if he gave me a second chance at life, that I would do everything in my power to represent each and every one of you in this city because I care about this city. With that being said, I respectfully ask for each of your votes, one of the nine, please consider me for your next city councilor. Thank you very much. For our last group, our final question of the evening. If elected for this term, what is the first thing you would do? What is the first thing you would like to accomplish as a city councilor? Starting with Leo Pelletier. Well, I've been around for a long time. Uh, I would like to see the biopark come in for jobs. I would like to see us finishing the water relining that we started five, six years ago. I would like to see all the school sold uh, very shortly. And of course, we are building a, another school, which I'd like to see that school finish on time and on the budget. And I would like to see that we have enough money to run everything in a city of Fall River with no problems whatsoever. If elected, I will do what I do and serve the people of Fall River. Thank you. Ray Mitchell. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here this evening and being an attentive audience. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things I would like, first things I would like to see done in our second term, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, I would like to see the waterfront development finally take off. Another thing I really would like to see is I would like to see our school system get out of being underperforming and provide an education that all of us can be proud of for each and every one of our youngsters. I would also like to see a road program and sidewalk program put together in Fall River. I know it sounds pie in the sky, but if we can get development in, on our waterfront and if we can get that biopark off the ground, believe me, with new revenues comes new opportunities. And these are things that I would like to fight for in my next term of office if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected. But I can't do it without you. Thank you. Ronald Cabral. If I got elected to City Council, my big thing is to hire more police officers in our city so they are walking beads in our neighborhood, Biopark in our neighborhood, Biopark. Economic development, it's for our waterfront. It's going for 20 years. We will work with Mike Mazzoza and the waterfront and the mayor and the Kalai office to help the city of Fulver. So I can schedule your nine votes on November 8, 2011. Thank you. David Dennis. If I'm elected, there are three things that I do want to do. And I said, I re started to say them earlier, but we ran out of time. So let me repeat them. We're going to need a plan, a strategic plan, that we need to implement in order to move the city of Fall River forward. We're going to need to decide who and what we want to be and how we want to get there. We'll need the master plan implemented in order to do that. Second of all, I want to create tight urban centers. It's a proven model. It's being done up in Quincy. We can do it in Fall River. We need to, be, to do that now. F f and, and finally, and probably the most important, we need to fully fund our schools. We need to provide our children with a world-class education. The number one consideration for a family of four, if they're going to move to an area, is education. If we want to restore the middle class to the city of Fall River, we want to bring those people back to the city of Fall River who buy properties, pay taxes, increase our local revenues, and pay for all the kinds of services that we've been talking about, we need to fix the schools in the city of Fall River. Those are my three priorities. Those are the three things I'll do if you elect me uh, as a member of the Fall River City Council, and I hope you do. I appreciate your support in the, pe in the past. Remember, I only lost my 39 votes the last time. Let's not do it this time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pat Casey. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say if I uh, get elected again, uh, I certainly will continue the avenue that I've been going. Uh, the fact is uh, the mill on the uh, Boulevard Duval Street has already started the waterfront in being developed. I will work hard to continue with that. Jerry's uh, uh, Remy's restaurant is coming into Fall River because of the support from the council, uh, making sure that the uh, laws and regulations are so that uh, he was able to uh, get the permitting and all that he's going to need. Uh, so this here is something that I will continue to work on, is creating jobs and the quality of life that everyone here deserves. Our waterfront is our front porch to the city of Fall River. I will also continue to work and work very hard to create a beach in Fall River. With all our waterfront, we don't have a beach, and we certainly do need the beach. I will continue to work with the neighborhood groups, and thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the candidates for coming this evening. Um, myself and, and the rest of our neighborhood association and the neighborhood associations throughout the city certainly appreciate it. I'd like to remind everyone that this has been um, being televised and will be uh, showing on Far River Government Television. Uh, thank the audience very much for, for being so attentive and uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight.